Hello everybody, uh, welcome to Naked Security Live. It's another Friday. I'm still Paul Ducklin and as you can see today's topic is the boot hole bug, what's it all about? Now the reason I chose the boot hole bug is not just that it's been a popular and slightly fun story on Naked Security this week, but it has got a lot of media attention for the reason that this bug, with its name, fancy name boot hole, is what we at Naked Security like to call jokingly, you understand, a Buane bug with an impressive name. And these bugs, often they get more media attention than perhaps they deserve, not because most of them, they don't just have a cool name like, like, uh, heart bleed, log jam, eternal blue, thunderbolt, or boot hole. Usually they have a cool logo as well. So here's the boot hole one. Um, I hope you can see that. Uh, you can see there's a there's a boot with a hole in the toe cap and what looks like a worm poking out of it. And of course, when you think about worm, you think computer worm, computer virus, it all sounds terribly scary. In fact, there was even one Buane back in the day called Orpheus's Liar, and it not only had a fancy name and a fancy logo, it even had a theme tune. Though, unfortunately, it's played on a ukulele, not on a lyre. Uh, so the idea is sometimes bugs, the people who find them, they're very proud of finding them, they've got every right to be. And in order to, to get the story across, they put in a fancy name, a catchy name, and a nice logo. And the deal with this, it has to do with the boot up process. So in other words, that's what happens between the time that you press power on on your computer and the time that your operating system actually begins loading fully. So you actually say, see a window screen or, a lin or the Linux kernel booting or whatever. In other words, your computer doesn't automatically just start into Windows or Mac OS or Linux or FreeBSD or OpenBSD or whatever it is. What typically happens is there's a so-called bootstrap or boot up process where the computer goes from just being a CPU, a load of empty memory and some flash memory inside the computer that has a startup program to actually running a full blown operating system like Windows. And as you can imagine, during that boot up process, there's an awful lot that can go wrong. And those of you with uh, long memories or an interest in history, or both, as I like to think of myself, uh, will know that in the old days, boot viruses, boot sector viruses, you might remember things like stoned, Angelina. There's a very famous one called Michelangelo, which uh, appeared on Michelangelo's six or seven hundredth birthday or something. That was that was just coincidence. That's how it got its name. It didn't have anything to do with Michelangelo in the virus. But these things were widely known because they got all over the place. And the problem is that they infected the actual boot time process between starting your computer and the operating system itself and all your security software actually firing up. And the problem is that once your operating system's running, even in the old days of DOS where everything was pretty wide open, the boot process is kind of, it's history, it's gone by, and it's sort of hidden down in a low area, a low part of, low level part of the computer where you can't easily access and see it. And so if crooks have put something in there that's malicious, it can be quite hard to find. So in the old days, the way it worked was like this. The computer powered up, it read a particular section of memory out of ROM, which is read-only memory. That was secure. It couldn't be changed by the same token. Couldn't be updated either. And that then read the very first physical sector off your hard disk or your floppy disk if you had one. And that was considered the boot up bootloader, the boot up program. One tiny little sector on the disk, 512 bytes, and that loaded the next part, and that loaded the operating system kernel, and then everything took over from there. And at the time that that little boot sector was running, there was no security at all. All memory was wide open, the disk was wide open, the operating system hadn't even, you, the, the computer didn't even know what operating system you had installed yet. And so if the crooks could insert code down there, which they could quite easily if they knew what they were doing, it was A, hard to find, B, hard to remove, and C, if you didn't know what you were doing while you were trying to remove it, you could mess up the computer completely. Because if you messed up that one little boot sector so that it couldn't actually load the operating system, then as soon as you turned on your computer, it would freeze. What to do? Well, in more recent computers, going back about 10 years now, 
Uh, instead of using what's called the BIOS, basic input output system, it's a very, very low level way of the reading in that boot sector and doing the bootstrap. Modern computers generally use a thing called UEFI, not to be confused with UEFA, the administrators of the European Football Association, but UEFA Universal Extensible Firmware Interface, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, is a much fancier way of starting up your computer that allows you to have uh, a special partition on your disk with a much bigger than one sector program that does a lot fancier things. So those of you who remember the old days, in fact, some, some computers still look like this. If you remember the setup screen that you had when your computer started, uh, it typically looked something like that. And while you were booting your computer, then all the startup messages and the boot sector and everything, it all looked like this. It was typically blue and white or black and white text mode, very, very basic. With UEFI boot up, you can have a lot more power. You can have graphical bootloader, you can have menus, you can have all kinds of features. But this is still something that is running before any protection is in place, before the operating system is loaded, before you have user accounts, logins, passwords, access control lists, and all that sort of stuff. So one thing that, that computers that use this newer UEFI system introduced was a thing called Secure Boot. Now, those of you who remember the history of Secure Boot will know that Microsoft was in some ways apparently controversially involved in it. They wanted all motherboards that would be used on Windows computers from about Windows 8. They said, you have to support Secure Boot. And there'd be a cryptographic key in there that would be provided by Microsoft. And the idea was that if Microsoft was selling a Windows computer, Secure Boot would give them a way of providing some kind of cryptographic digital signature protection on that stuff that runs between powering on and the operating system actually being able to put protections in place. Secure, secure boot was supposed to mean that if a crook could get in and actually change the, the boot up sequence, the bootstrap, the bootloader, the bootstrap program in this UEFI system, then it wouldn't be allowed to run by the computer itself. Now, Microsoft got into all sorts of hot water. People said, oh, you're trying to stop us converting our computer to use Linux later and so on and so on. It turned out that wasn't the case. In fact, Microsoft just required this to be on in those days. Now they're a little more relaxed. The idea being that it would stop boot sector viruses and that kind of so-called rootkit problems from being such a hassle on, on Windows systems. But you can actually alter the encryption keys if you want uh, on most computers by going into the setup system. I see a commenter has come. It's Teresa, oh, hello. hello. Teresa says, hello from Canada. Is this only a Windows thing? What about other OSs? Excellent question, and we shall get onto that in just a moment. Because the deal is that most modern computers, if this com secure boot system is turned on, won't load bootstrap code, bootloader code, in other words, pre-operating system stuff, where protection while the program is running is quite minimal. The way the computer protects this with Secure Boot is this cryptographic digital signature that says, well, this bootloader loads that program, and that program loads the operating system, and the operating system looks after itself. But all these things in the interim, although they don't have the same protections while they're running as the operating system, we won't let them run unless they're digitally signed. And this does provide a significant amount of extra security, particularly against casual modification, where a crook comes along and runs a program as an administrator and just changes your boot sequence. You can't really see that's happened. And lo and behold, next time you boot up, the crooks loaded their malware before your operating system even gets to run. So Se Secure Boot was supposed to take back some of the control that the crooks enjoyed in the bad old days of the Michelangelo's, the Angelina, the boot sector viruses, the root kits, etc., etc. Great idea. So what the boot hole bug was, now the good news is that if you don't have a Linux partition or you're not booting into Linux on your laptop, this isn't a direct problem for you. So it's a problem in a boot loader program that is pretty much specific to Linux distributions. And if you do have Linux partition and you're not using the bootloader program called Grub, uh, the grand unified bootloader. It's quite big and complicated for something that's only supposed to find your operating system and load it. And that's probably, its complexity means more likely to have bugs in. So if you have Linux and you have this thing called Grub, which many Linux distributions do use, uh, many as a default, 
then that's when this bug applies. Now, there is a small risk if you or a small uh, item of interest if you're a Windows user. But if you've got a Mac that's just got straight Mac OS, if you've got a Windows computer that just has a Windows partition, you don't have to worry too much. But you probably want to listen to this story because it's kind of quite an interesting reminder of how the strongest cryptographic protections in the world with the most bits of encryption and the most fantastically super secure enclave stored passwords and encryption keys and, and signing keys can go wrong if you make one tiny little bug. So what happens when you're not running something that's a Microsoft operating system where the key in your, the, the signing key in your computer, typically the one that comes with it, if you buy a Windows laptop, will be Microsoft's key. And Microsoft has signed a whole load of bootloaders, including those from, from non-Microsoft systems. And so generally, if you have a Linux system, what typically happens is that the system verifies the bootloader. The bootloader loads this thing called shim or preloader. Those are the two common ones used in Linux. And that's an open source variant that has its own cryptographic key stored with it. And that checks the bootloader, which in this case would be Grub. And if Grub hasn't been tampered with or modified, it's a legitimate signed version from your operating system vendor, then it and only then is it allowed to start your operating system up. However, when, because Grub is so powerful, it has a configuration file, file imaginatively called grub.cfg, and when reading this file, there are all sorts, it can make fancy menus, you can have graphical backdrops, programs that load, it's super fancy. But the problem is that the configuration file, which affects the behavior of this Grub bootloader, which is digitally signed, the configuration file, which is just text, is not digitally signed, because hey, Everyone knows text is harmless, right? It's just messages, except that the program that is digitally signed, that reads the text file that is supposed to be harmless that is not digitally signed, contains a buffer overflow bug. And it's a very embarrassing bug for the programmers. Basically, if you have a line that's too long, so you say, display this message, and then you put this enormous long line that's far too long to fit on the screen, Grub detects that, it says, hey, that line's too long. It reports the error, it detects that a buffer overflow would happen. It correctly reports the error, so you'll see a brief message if you happen to be looking at the screen. And then guess what? It ignores the fact that it just reported the error and goes on processing the program. Buffer overflow happens. And what that means is that inside this text file, you can actually squirrel away executable code, what's called shell code, that will run. And remember, that, that file is not digitally signed. So a crook who has administrator root access to your Linux computer and can modify this grub.cfg file can essentially install their own bootloader, pre-operating system bootloader code that isn't signed, and they'll evade the digital signatures entirely because of this bug. So in a way, this bug is interesting more for the fact that it's interesting than the fact that it's really, really dangerous, um, because to, inf to affect a Linux system by modifying this configuration file, particularly if they're doing it with malware that you downloaded, the crooks would have to persuade you not just to run this malware, but to run it as root or administrator. And of course, if the crooks already have a program that they can run with administrator powers, then maybe booting up is the last thing you have to worry about because they can basically read all your files, sniff all your network traffic and monitor all your keystrokes, modify everything, ransomware your whole system. So the crooks already, it's not like they can sit remotely and just ping network packets at your computer and control it but, uh, and take over the boot process. But it is an interesting reminder that cryptographic systems designed to implement security, which might be completely secure themselves, can easily be let down by one tiny little bug, an error, an error function that detected an error, reported the error, and then actually forgot to actually stop processing um, the dangerous data. So that's the bug. What do you do about it if you're on Linux? Well. There's a Grub update, so you can go and get that. Um, there is a risk that you may have read about. Let me just check comments here. Uh, Hex Editrix affects Linux with Grub. Yes, technically Grub 2. There's an earlier version of Grub, but most people, because Grub 2 is the, is the only really supported version now, most people refer to Grub 2 as just Grub, as I said. So Linux and Grub. But the problem is that if you have a Windows computer and a crook gets physical access to your computer. Now, you might imagine that if they've got physical access, well, all bets are off anyway. And to some extent, that's true. 
Uh, what they can do is they can take a Linux boot USB device. And if your computer allows somebody to boot off USB, they can boot off that USB stick. They can deliberately implant a boot hole bug there. And that means that on your Windows computer, even though they may not be interested in mounting your Windows partition, even though they won't know the password if you're using BitLocker to be able to decrypt it, the idea is that what they could do is by just booting into Linux while triggering this bug, they do get a chance to run before your operating system starts, bootloader code that isn't supposed to be there. Now, there are a few things they can do and there are many things they can't do at that point. It's not supposed to happen, so it's still bad if that occurs. And how to protect against that particular problem, which remember, the person has to have physical control of your laptop. How to deal with that problem if you're on Windows is something that's got a lot of people worried. However, remember that if your computer is set up, and most people's computers at home, mine certainly is just for my own convenience, and I normally keep it locked up at home, and I don't take it out on the road often these days due to, due to lockdown, but if the crooks can get at what's called your BIOS setup or your CMOS setup or your configuration screen, like I said, I showed that earlier. Some of you will have been to that screen. That's a rather old one. I got that picture from the Free Software Foundation. That's from about 10 years ago. But for example, on Lenovo's, you'll still see that, that blue background. I have a Lenovo computer at home. And, uh, you know, so you may see, if a crook can get into that setup screen on your computer, like you can, you typically, you probably know you press F1, somewhere F2, F10, F12, escape, delete. Some Lenovo's even have a special magic blue button just above the keyboard that you can press. In theory, if they can get into that setup screen anyway, then they can actually go in usually and turn this secure boot system off and then boot your system so they wouldn't need the vulnerability. So in general, if you've got a Windows computer, there's no Linux, there's no Linux bootloaders involved, then if the, crook, the crooks can't directly exploit this bug by tricking you into running a program because the, you need to have Grub installed on your computer for that to work, and if they have physical access to your computer, then it's a little bit of a moot point about whether they can use this bug to do some pre-boot rootkitting shenanigans on your Windows computer if they can go into your BIOS setup and actually turn off secure boot or allow themselves to boot anyway. So the last thing I want to mention is what could a company do if it's worried about bugs like this, about, about, about crooks abusing bugs like this to run pre-boot code uh, that isn't supposed to be allowed what a lot of particularly business laptops do, I know uh, Lenovo's can be set up like this. As I say, I, I have one, it's a, it's a work laptop and it is indeed set up like this, is you can actually configure the computer so, you, so that the, the, a normal user can't go into the configuration screen. And what you want to do is you want to set it up so that it boots only from the internal disk. That way, if a cook wants to do something with the internal disk, they would actually have to take the trouble, get your computer, they'd have to open it up, have to take the disk out, not break anything, and then plug the disk in somewhere else and try and do their shenanigans there. So it's not something if they just grab your laptop at a coffee shop, stick in the USB key, if you leave it in the hotel room for 20 minutes. They're probably not going to have time to do this. So what many businesses do is they lock down the computer so that secure boot is on if they want it on, and booting from external devices is off. And that's a good strength, provided that the password that you need to unlock the setup system, the BIOS setup, is actually securely implemented by the vendor. And so here's the word of warning that I will leave you with if you're a company. Certainly this is true with Lenovo's. If you forget, if you lock it down to make bugs like this and attacks using USB booting essentially impossible on business laptops, the problem is that if you forget the password for that particular laptop, then even the vendor can't fix it for you. There's no, that's a feature, not a bug. And basically, Lenovo, go to their website, I'll warn you, this is a fantastic security feature. We recommend that you use it, but if you forget the password, you will need to buy a new motherboard. And they're not doing that just so they can get a new motherboard out of it. They're doing it because there isn't a back door that actually lets them figure out what the password was and remove it. Jonathan is saying, Linux would break if that was attempted backup people. Um, or oh, I may have missed a previous comment. Um, of course, as we know, backups are important, not just because of this bug, not just because of ransomware, but because electrical surges, water flooding, fire, theft, all of that stuff means that you may suddenly without, be without data and you need to restore it.
So the deal here is boot hole, it got the, it got, by the way, I thought first what I didn't like about that logo. Um, I thought, oh, they're trying to make out like it's a worm and it could turn into a computer virus. In fact, I realized afterwards, that's not a worm, folks. It's got little end, it's got two antennae. Uh, it's a grub. Ha. So it's quite a cute logo. The deal is you probably don't need to worry about this bug, particularly if you're not running Linux. If you are running Linux and you're using grub, you can get an update and that will remove the problem. And if you are running Windows and you, it's a business computer and you're in the IT department, consider locking those computers down to make so that things like secure boot and the boot sequence can't be changed by the user. But bear in mind that there are, that there are risks in doing that. So thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you're not too worried and had a little bit of fun listening to this bug. Um, it, it's not quite like a like a, a, a heart bleed or an eternal blue, where there's a risk that the crooks could remotely just jump into your computer or steal data from it. It's a little more subtle than that, but it is an indicator that if you're a programmer, you need to be careful at all times because tiny little bugs can crush even the strongest cryptographic systems if you aren't careful. So thanks for listening and until next time folks, stay secure and stay healthy.